afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Guilherme Correa, uh, and I will be the chair of this session. Thank, thanks a lot for, for your presence here in, in this first talk of this afternoon. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Matthias Wien to you. Professor Matthias Wien um, received the Diploma and Doctor of Engineering degrees from the Rheinisch Westfälische Technische Hochschule Aachen in Germany. He is currently a professor with the RWTH Aachen University, the leader of the Visual Media Communication Group and head of administration. The research interests of Professor Vin include image and video processing, immersive space frequency adaptive and scalable video compression, robust video transmission and visual quality assessment. And since 2020, Matthias uh, uh, serves as a convener of the MPEG Visual Quality Assessment Adopt Group. He has been an active contributor to the H264 AVC, HVC, and VVC, and has participated and contributed to several groups such as the MPEG Group, the Joint Video Team, the Joint Collaborative Team on Video Coding, and the Joint Video Experts Team, the JVET. Um, Matthias is currently a co chair of the JVET Adopt Group 4. Uh, which is uh, named as Test Material and Visual Assessment, and is the coordinator for the JVET verification tests of VVC. And today, Matthias is here with us presenting the talk MPEG AG5 Visual Quality Assessment, Testing Guidelines and Metrics. Thanks a lot, Matthias, for accepting our invitation to speak at, at the fifth uh, DBVSA. <laughs> we are glad to, ha to have you here with us this afternoon. And now the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for this very kind introduction. So, um, as already mentioned by Graham, the, the, the title of my talk is uh, MPEG 85 Visual Quality Assessment Testing Guidelines and Metrics. The outline is as follows. So, I, I will give a little overview on the, on the structure of, of um, uh, MPEG VQA. As you might know, MPEG has been, uh, has undergone some, some quite some restructuring. And uh, so, I thought it's probably helpful to, to explain a bit of uh, how, how these things work out. Then I want to talk a bit about verification testing, which we are actually doing. And uh, talking about some guidelines that we have um, invented or, or, or defined uh, for these purposes. And uh, I, I will show some results uh, for the example of VVC, uh, which is the, how to say, maybe the largest um, project that we had recently. There are actually quite some more, which I also will briefly mention. I will talk a little bit about challenges in quality assessment for immersive, immersive uh, visual media, uh, specifically the issues is that we are quite flexible there with the six degrees of freedom. And then I will talk about remote experts viewing and uh, the detailing a bit of, uh, of how this is actually done. This is also some, something that is now put into some guidelines uh, for, for MPEG. And I would like to share some, some results and some insights um, from there, and then we'll come to some conclusions. I understand that we have uh, something like like uh, 70 minutes or so for the whole thing, 75 minutes maybe. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to, to raise your hands so that we can, um, that I can pick that up. Um, I, I will try to, to also look at, at some, some, some uh, questions during the talk so that we can have some, some kind of interactivity. Uh, I think it should not be a purely frontal thing where I just would be talking, but uh, I would, like to, to get some, some feedback from, from your side. Okay, so um, let's dive in. Introduction to MPEG VQA. Um, VQA, so the AG5 is, is part of the so-called uh, subcommittee 29 of ISO IEC Joint Technical Committee 1. So it's a relatively complicated name, but that's basically the, the um, place where all the media um, coding and transmission specifications are developed uh, in, in ISO IEC. And um, as I mentioned before, um, MPEG has been restructured and was actually uh, about one year from now, a bit more than one year. And um, before it was uh, basically, SC29 consisted basically of two working groups, working group one and working group 11 for, for JPEG and for MPEG. And now MPEG has been restructured to have seven working groups and uh, three other groups. Uh, advisory groups, I, I just highlighted them here. So what has been subgroups before in, uh, the, in the WG11 is now basically uh, our working groups. And then we have basically three additional 
advisory groups, including the one that I'm leading, that's the one on visual quality assessment. Um, that's why I use the acronym uh, VQA, okay? Um, otherwise, basically the work of MPEG is continuing um, as it has been done before. So, so there's um, a whole lot of activities. I, this is not meant to be read uh, in detail. I can point you to the, to the uh, work plan um, if, you, if you want to, but just, just to indicate there's a lot of, of activities going on, including audio, video, uh, immersive video, um, including like like um, well point clouds, meshes, um, um, and and these kind of things, video coding for machines, uh, but also haptics. And then there's a whole lot of uh, activities going on in the area of uh, systems and tools, and some some activities also beyond uh, media, for example, including uh, neural network uh, compression for neural networks uh, for multimedia, and uh, also uh, compression of genome information. Okay, but, but so this is this is basically the, the scheme that we are at now. Now let's look at, at the advisory group five. Uh, that's the one um, that I'm that I'm leading, and so there is a so-called set of terms of reference um, that defined. I don't want to to read all of all of them just to, to give you an idea of what it's about. The main thing is because the name is a visual quality assessment. Of course, is to um, well to to guide and to, to educate the, the standardization groups on uh, conducting um, appropriate quality assessments in the standardization processes, right? And so, so this is basically then what we, are, we are, what we are up to. There's a lot of items that are considered uh, concerned with uh, the um, development of new proposals of new standards. Um, this is where the so-called call for proposals or the call for evidence are used. And then this is typically a case where a lot of uh, visual assessment is done and the, the results have to be interpreted. So this is one of the major goals. Um, but then also the quality assessment um, in, the, in the general context of the standardization activities is, uh, is within the scope and also test material uh, that is used for those, um, uh, for, for those assessments. And of course, um, well, educating or, or uh, updating the, the, the capabilities of, of uh, test laboratories and um, Cooperate and liaise with uh, other organizations, specifically the ITU, which has a um, quite a history in um, development of um, recommendations for for visual quality assessments. So, how is the advisory group structured? Um, I'm not doing it all by myself. Um, I have basically four focus um, group chairs um, who are well leading the the, the developments in, in the respective. Um, uh, let's say the respective modalities. We have uh, uh, Vittorio Barancini um, being uh, the, the chair for SDR video, so standard dynamic range. We have Andrew Siegel um, for the HDR case. We have Yan Yi of Alibaba from, for the 360 degree video case. And we have Joel Jung for the immersive video case. And so th those four are basically my. Uh, uh, by my supporters and my, my chairs for, for those specific purposes. And then we have so-called ad hoc groups. Those are, um, th those are groups that exist from, from standardization meeting to standardization meeting. We actually have, typically we have four standardization meetings per year. So one in January, one in April, one in July, one in October, and then it goes round. And in between those meetings, uh, we have so-called ad hoc group um, definitions where an ad hoc group would uh, deal with a certain topic and um, then, then produce uh, inputs to the next meeting where the decisions would be done. Currently, we have three of those. We have one at, at our group on the quality of immersive visual media, uh, which is producing an overview on, on quality metrics and methodologies um, for, the, for such assessment, um, and also um, doing some, some comparisons and evaluations of subjective methods and objective metrics. Um, this at group actually is also active in communicating to the outside um, of MPEG world, so to say, um, which is um, by, the, by the means of, of workshops. We already had a first public work workshop that was held um, in the beginning of October, so about three weeks um, ago, just before the, the, before the last MPEG meeting. And so our intention is to continue this uh, activity just to, be, to connect to, to other people and maybe also attract people for providing inputs um, to our activities and I invite everybody to, to come in and, and contribute and um, be part of this um, activity. 
Then we have uh, the second agile group, um, which is on learning based quality metrics for 2D video. Um, so this one is, um, well, there is some overlap with the immersive, uh, immersive um, visual media because with, with that other group, because of course, also their learning based metrics might be applied. But uh, here we want to study uh, actually this specific aspect of being learning based. And so um, the, the idea behind is that uh, in the advent of potential um, network based um, compression methods, we might lose the uh, the so far established um, approach of having pixel fidelity. Yeah, so typically a, a conventional video scheme would try to approximate the, the, the original signal um, by, by accurate representation on, on a pixel level. And this is, may not necessarily be the case in the future. And then uh, we, get, uh, we, we lose basically all the established and well understood methods uh, of quality assessments, objective quality assessments that we have. So the idea is um, that we try to prepare for that. And um, this is uh, the activity that's going on there uh, by collecting data, um, uh, bases which are suitable, uh, assessing um, learning based quality metrics and also studying, this is I think the most important point, the correlation between the metrics um, that would be measured and the subjective course, uh, uh, scores that would be achieved. This is something that actually is uh, also applies for, for other metrics, of course, but uh, specifically here, we would like to understand how reliable those metrics are, um, specifically in the context of standards development when we want to um, well, decide if a tool would be adopted or not adopted uh, into a specification. And there we need a reliable um, measure, which uh, could be the objective metrics if they are reliable or otherwise would need to be done by su subjective evaluation. And the third one is on uh, guidelines, um, which is basically, uh, definitions for verification tests is basically then the next topic that we are going to, to look at and the guidelines for remote experts viewing. Um, the, these have basically been, or this, this ETA group has been installed just to produce something which is written on paper so that people have uh, a clear understanding of uh, how these processes should go. And uh, since it's something which is uh, sometimes debated uh, to, to some extent, um, I, I want to focus on that a little bit um, in, in this, uh, in, the, in the next slides. Um, so we, uh, th those guidelines, they are actually, they have been released in, uh, as, a, as a version one at the, um, at the October meeting. So just, just um, about two weeks from now. Um, it comprises the definition well, of the purposes, of the procedures, test materials, bitstream waypoints, the conduction of the actual tests and the reporting. And I just go through the, uh, throw those bullets in a, in a brief um, review. So uh, what are the goals of such verification testing? Obviously, it would be uh, checking out if the uh, goals of the standardization activity actually have been fulfilled. And this is uh, typically achieved by uh, demonstrating what is the compression capability of the new specification in relevant application scenarios. Yeah, so this is, um, I think, the, the core element because that's public information and uh, this is meant to, to help understanding what the new specification might be uh, able to do and uh, how it relates to, uh, to performance wise to, to its predecessors, for example. And um, then of course, um, there, there may be other components um, that, that are um, included in the specification, which are not only compression capability, but for example, having other requirements such as uh, like, like uh, certain uh, types of, of data and so forth. And this is all, um, this is basically also a, a goal of those verification tests to demonstrate such things um, and the fulfillment of those requirements um, in the standardization activity. So what is the procedure? Um, typically there would be some, some kind of plan defining of how the test would be done. Um, for this purpose, the, the work items, so the, the specification, the new specification must be somewhere close to a final state. Otherwise uh, it does not make so much sense because things might change too much. And then uh, the working group that's doing the standards is um, consulting with us with AG5 VQA uh, for a verification uh, test plan for that item. AG5 then uh, basically um, well sets a test coordinator who is responsible for for all the coordination and the, um, the selection of test laboratories, um, the conduction of the tests, and the uh, finally the um, preparation of of the inputs uh, to the to this uh, standards to the standards committee. 
um, the verification test plan is developed and then jointly approved by both the um, advisory group and the respective working group. And then the, uh, the test laboratories um, basically reports the results to AG5 and then AG5 um, takes them, approves them and um, propagates them to the working group. And then the working group is producing a test report um, for public release. This sounds a bit complicated, maybe, but this is uh, something that's required. Uh, it's required because we have this this structure of these different groups, and we want to make sure that everybody um, understands very well what is done there, and um, that that the results are actually um, at a professional level and um, made for for public public access. Okay, so what should the the tests then look like the first one is the selection of the of the test material here of course you need uh for for each of the application scenarios that are under consideration uh, you need a set of representative test sequences um, quite obviously there's a very strong recommendation not to use any content that has been used during the standards development phase in order to avoid uh, the impression that there might be just a, a sweet spot um assessment that that would have been conducted and so this is also something which i think um, is, is quite important just just to make sure that that the results are independent of the development process okay um, there needs to be uh, some kind of balance between the number of data points that are um, assessed and also of course it starts with the number of test sequences typically something like four to five per uh, application scenario might be adequate uh, there may be a bit less depending on how you can combine such, such scenarios there may be more depending on what you want to demonstrate and so um, then there's something this is actually more like a practical uh, thing a recommendation <laughs> to collect uh, um, some some kind of uh, unique identification measures for example the md5 sum uh, so that that uh, people can identify the, the sources that have been used um, in the in the tests okay um how would the material be be uh, prepared um, well, you have uh, um, well typically a, a comparison between the the new scheme that has been developed and uh, a relevant predecessor that would typically be called the anchor point. So we have an anchor, and then we have the the proposed new scheme. Um, obviously, or may, maybe obviously, I don't know. Um, the com configuration should be as comparable as possible for both the anchor and the new scheme, because. Um, that enables comparison that, that tells you how close you are uh, in terms of uh, um, or, or how, how much of, of benefit you get by, by using the new, the new scheme. And this in, in implies that also all relevant tools available in the anchor shall be used. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, this is basically to, to strike out that the verification test is not trying to, uh, to tweak some, some numbers so that you would have in the end, you would have some kind of wonderful compression numbers that could be reported, but then it's, uh, maybe people outside would not be able to reproduce those. So this is why, why we have these kind of constraints, so that we want to have somewhat hard and, and reliable numbers that represent the, the actual gains that are that are achieved. Okay, and the the, the preparation of those uh, bit streams is actually supposed to be done by multiple independent parties, uh, including cross checking, um, so so that the correctness of the encoding process is asserted and also that the encoder configuration correctness um, is um, basically um, confirmed. And this is something that's, uh, again, this sounds kind of um, easy, but there's, uh, it's, it's not so, it's, it's actually something that happens that there are some configuration glitches and if people are very careful, this um, helps to improve the quality of the overall um, setting. And what kind of breakpoints should we, should we use for the, for the testing itself? And this is actually something that's uh, um, that requires quite some effort, and um, if it's not carefully done, may also lead to some some less uh, useful results. So the first recommendation is that there would be four to five uh, rate points. It's not recommended to have more because otherwise the distance on the on the um, mean opinion score scale would be uh, too small, and then it becomes difficult. Um, and then. The, the allocation of those um, those points um, could follow two different uh, strategies. Well, the first one would be to, to do you define rate rate points, so you have a, a certain target rate, and then 
um, you construct the bit streams in a way that you have a rate matching between the, the anchor and the proposed scheme. And so this actually allows you to basically just look at the at the same rate and then you can see, okay, if I code the, with the old scheme, I'm at this quality. If I code with the other scheme as a new one, then I'm at, at that quality and thereby I see di direct difference. The other option would be that you try to have much quality of the rate points um, because that would allow you to compute um, overall rate savings in a more stable manner. And so this is um, this is typically done using the so-called Biontegar delta rate method. So this is something that I will come to um, in one of the next slides. And um, well, if you have five points specifically, then it's a bit easier. And a bit depending on the performance relation between the two schemes, it may actually be achievable to ha have both um, points of quality matching and rate matching uh, at the same time at the same rate points. And I just put an example kind of a, a glimpse into what's, uh, what we are looking at uh, later on um, in the, well, this is a pulled results, but it's um, mostly applying also for the for the separate sequence where you see that this kind of has achieved, uh, has been achieved. So we have roughly rate matching at the uh, at those four lower rate points of the anchor. This is uh, HEVC, the blue curve here. And then uh, at the same time, we have roughly quality matching for the, um, for these uh, five rate points over the curve, so that we have, we try to to achieve both things. It's not always possible. It really depends on um, how how the how the involvement of the quality is, how far the, the schemes are apart, and things like that. Okay, and um, to achieve that, um, well, you you need to have some some kind of process. It's an iterative process, typically starting off from from objective uh, objective metrics. Um, have some some pre-selection also for the suitability for subjective evaluation. Not all test sequences which are excellent for development of the specific of the of, the, of a standard are actually very good for subjective evaluation. Maybe because like like the, the camera is too unstable. Maybe you have too many scene cuts and it's very uh, difficult to handle uh, in the in the context of a of a uh, formal subjective assessment and and things like that. So there are many aspects that have to be considered and um, there, there needs to be some some kind of pre-selection um, in this regard and then dry run experiments are strongly recommended where we would have uh, for example expert viewing sessions um, trying out uh, the, the rate points that are proposed or maybe even formal more or less formal uh, viewing sessions with naive subjects um, the difference is if you use experts um, that would mean people who who were involved in the development of the specification, these people may actually have very specific uh, ways of looking at, at uh, certain artifacts because they have studied them or maybe they have proposed something to, to cope with uh, certain with certain problems. And so they have a very precise and very educated view on those sequences, potentially even recognizing certain aspects um, from very tiny details in the scene. Uh, while the naive subjects, Look at it very differently because they have they don't know about those things. They just look at the overall quality and they then come to a judgment. And there might be actually some some um, difference between those uh, assessments. So one has to be careful and, and really um, check out how the relation should be um, when coming to the final formal evaluation in the context of the verification tests. And that is then typically done um, using. Uh, either, well, DSIS, so double stimulus impairment scale, that's the name uh, coming from the famous uh, BT500 uh, recommendation from, from ITUR, or uh, under the name DCR, degradation category rating, that's um, the basically the same scheme, but specified by ITUT in P910. Okay, so those are the the two names and they, they can be exchanged um, basically in the, in the practical application they are. And so how that basically works is you do a evaluation of the scheme under test for each rate point um, against the um, unimpaired reference. So that would be, that we would call it the original sequence. So you have the uncompressed original video and then uh, you have the, the coded version. So then one so-called basic test cell is built as follows. You have the original sequence, um, so the uncompressed one, you have a short break, then you have the coded version. Typically those sequences are of, uh, of 10 seconds of length, and then you have five seconds of voting time, right? And so, so within this, so sometimes this is repeated just to provide more stability, but this is the kind of the core element 
And you have the original ones and the coded one ones. Um, and then while, while watching the, the coded one, maybe also while watching then the repetition, people should make up their mind how they would score the, um, the coded version in comparison to that original. Yeah, so the, the task is really to, to tell how much it's devi deviating from, from the original. And then this is uh, one specific way of looking at the quality assessment. You could also do other things, but that's the one that has been established already for quite a while and um, seems to work pretty stable also. And the, the, the scale that we are using is a 11 grade scale. So we, we go from 10, which would correspond to no difference to the original. Yeah, so there's uh, imperceptible impairments in, in, the, in the video that you observe, that would be the 10. And then you gradually go, go down until you reach the zero and you go from slightly perceptible to perceptible, then clearly perceptible, annoying, and then severely annoying. And you see here that you have basically five scales in here, which kind of represents the, the typical five scale most values that we would have um, in the um, in, in the other context where we, we would do the evaluation only with, with five values. So the 11 grades have, have been, uh, or have demonstrated that they are quite effective. Actually, I can can tell you that if the, if, the, if, yeah, if um, so if, if I'm training the naive test subjects to, to conduct such experiments, after after um, a while, they, they start saying, oh, well, maybe I would like to have uh, more detail on that scale. So that means that they, they want to distinguish between something that might be a four or a five, so they, they're searching for something like a 4.5 or so on. And this, this tells me that the, the, um, the scoring grid is, um, is something which, is, which people, uh, that people can well handle. So we don't need to be coarser than that. Uh, but at the same time, we do not want to be too precise so, uh, or too, too, too fine, because that also might may be a challenge in, in decisions. So we, we come up with this. Um, with the scoring that uh, has been established for a while. Okay, and then in the end, there would be some rec uh, reporting that basically in includes all the activity, uh, the scopes, the results, the test procedures, conditions, uh, the, the test logistics, what has been done, which equi equipment has been used, uh, how many subjects have been involved, um, how the voting has been done, the processing of the data, um, how the MOS values have been achieved, uh, what kind of confidence intervals we, we would have, and then, of course, plots of the results, um, so that uh, that people can make up their uh, their minds, and uh, also a summary of the of those beyond the guard rate savings, um, uh, which basically tell you over the range of rates uh, that you are looking at for a sequence, uh, what would be the the overall average um, saving that you that you encounter. And then, of course, if there are any specific features or aspects that um, that should be mentioned. And then those um, th those would be highlighted just to indicate um, to the outside world about the specific features that are available there. Now let's come to the beyond the guard uh, delta rate savings. Uh, this is a method that has been established uh, for quite a while. Actually, the original contribution you see down here, you see the references, uh, is uh, now 20 years old, uh, a bit more than 20 years old, where it was first proposed by Gisela beyond the guard. Um, where he said, okay, so let's assume we have four rate points. And then um, at that time, the rate points were actually not too far off. It was a bit different uh, than, from what uh, is, uh, is being tested right now. And then you would have, uh, you could do a polynomial fit um, of those uh, points, which is very easy then also to compute. And then you could, uh, uh, then you can, com can compute the, the, basically the difference of the area between the two curves. And then you can do that either in the horizontal direction telling you but it's rate saving, or you could do that in the vertical direction, which then would provide you the, the number for the, um, for example, the the the, the, the piece and R gain that you that you have achieved. Okay, and um, well, so for doing the, so, the actually the, the rate is um, log logarithmized. Yeah, so the um, you don't look at the rate as on a linear scale, but on a logarithmic scale, um, and that um, if if you do so, then the a typical well-behaving rate distortion curve is almost linear. That uh, that was supporting this first uh, polynomial interpolation approach. Um, today, uh, piecewise interpolation is used, uh, which is a bit more stable. Um, specifically, if the if the rate points are further apart, and also if the the curves are let's say showing some somewhat more special behavior, where a poly polynomial may have some some 
kind of overshoots just to meet the rate points which do not fit the expected behavior of a of a true rate distortion curve. And so this is basically the um, the approach. And there's one important aspect uh, that you can only compute the um, the Yontegaard delta for overlapping ranges of the curve. This is what, what this figure show illustrates. So it has this orange curve, it has the blue curve, and obviously the Biontegaard delta can only be computed in the overlap. If, if this is Biontegaard rate saving, so we are looking into, into the horizontal direction. And um, so the, the number that comes out, and in this case, this would be a significant um, a rate distance between those, uh, those two schemes, but um, the, the delta is only computed on a, a small portion of the, of the curve. And that's why in order to prevent that, we, we try to have those, um, this, this alignment of the rate points in a way that allows us um, to, to um, well, to have as much overlap of the two curves as possible so that the number is um, more representative for the overall performance. Um, because this is something that may, be, uh, may not be um, identified by, by non-educated um, readers of, of such documents. Now, if we, we, we can do that also with uh, MOS values, not only with P's and R or other metrics, um, but if we have the uh, MOS, then we have to consider that the measurement is not a, uh, a strictly reproducible uh, objective number that could, could be um, reproduced by any expert who wants to, to run such an experiment, but it's something that comes from the uh, opinions of the test subjects. So there's always a confidence level that tells us, okay, with a certain probability, we would reproduce the um, these results and so typically we, we compute the 95% confidence interval so that we would have a um, quite a certain confidence of, of being able to reproduce. Now if we would, this isn't just a, a visual example, we, we, we would have this um, MOS range of the, on this 11 grade scale, so ranging from 0 to, to 10, here the, the only a portion of the scale is represented, we have a certain range of, of uh, bit rates if this is from, from 5 megabits up to 25 megabits per second. And now here we have three different scheme, schemes. And we see the, 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 the strong lines. Those are the MOS values. So we have the, the, the um, dots marked, which are the MOS values that we have measured. So in this case, it was five rate points. And then we have the confidence intervals. And in this case, the, uh, the confidence intervals were just connected to, to illustrate the area of the, of the confidence that we have. Okay, so now in, in this case, it's, I, I think it's um, pretty um, obvious that, that the, the curves are very far apart, so some kind of computation should be quite easy. But how would we handle close cases? And then uh, there we found an agreement that would say, okay, so if it's too close, then we would not report to beyond the Gart delta, but just say maybe there's some, some benefit in, in, in some way. And so this is basically done by looking at the the best cases, the worst cases, and the average cases. Right? And, and this is just to give you an example. This is then a, a curve for that. So again, we have the same um, MOS range from zero to ten. We have these these curves sitting on this uh, this X. In this case, those two schemes are pretty pretty close. Now um, we could could say, well, what would be the best case? So let's say we have the red the red scheme would be the proposal. The blue scheme would be uh, our anchor. And so, I mean, just looking at the curve, we would say, okay, the, the red scheme is a bit better than the than the blue scheme because of the high rates, it's providing some gain, right? Now, in the best case, we could say, well, if we want to compare, then I take the confidence interval and I take the upper boundary for the proposal and I take the lower boundary for the um, for the anchor. So just looking at basically those two, now the, these curves that I have here, the, the, the um, strong curve uh, for the red and for the blue colors. And if I would do the beyond the gut computation, then I would get 32% 32, um, 32 of rate saving between this um, uh, fat red curve and the, and the blue curve. So that would be quite an impressive number. But I can also invert that and just say, okay, now let me use the other extreme and I would use the lower end of the confidence interval uh, for the anchor, uh, for, for the proposal and the, um, the upper, end of the confidence interval for the proposal uh, for, for the anchor. And in that case, the curves would look like this. So suddenly the blue curve is above the red curve. And so um, it's only they are only crossing somewhere in the uh, in the upper range of the of the rates. And now if we would do the beyond the computation again, 
we end up with 25% of loss. And so those two numbers are contradicting. And if I, well, if I uh, would just take the MOS as it is in the average case, then I would, uh, I would get the number 7% uh, of rate savings. But since they are not so reliable, um, the decision then is uh, not to report such values. This is basically um, a very practical one. I mean, you, you could do a lot of um, more sophisticated uh, evaluations to find out um, what, what kind of, of differences should be there. But um, the, the, the idea that we had in, in going for this very simple scheme uh, was to be able to explain this to virtually anybody who's, um, who's reading such a document and they're not understanding or, or um, having difficulties to understand why some numbers would be reported yes or no. And I think this, this scheme is pretty easy to, to understand. Okay, there has been a number of, of verification tests that have been conducted already, including um, EVC, LC EVC, uh, and VVC, of course, that's basically the one that I'm going to report next on. We just finished um, verification sets, um, a te a verification test sets um, for, for the VPCC. Uh, this is immersive video um, scheme. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm coming to those, those aspects of, of immersive schemes um, soon. So um, this, is, um, this is the ones that, that have been conducted uh, since last October. So we are basically now existing since, uh, uh, since one year. And um, this already has been quite some activity uh, in, the, in the past, okay? Uh, or in, 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 the, in the last 12 months. And there are some more activities coming up, like immersive video coming, and uh, VVC is not done yet um, because of its versatility. There's many many aspects that people are interested to do such testing on, uh, including scalability, screen content coding, and, and other aspects. Let's go to to VVC. And um, actually, I, I I think I saw some some presentations in the workshop uh, that were dealing with uh, uh, recoding schemes. So probably you have some. Uh, knowledge on that already, but I, I just have a brief summary and I maybe I um, go quite quickly over it. Um, if, if you if you feel that there should be some some more, just please don't hesitate to uh, well to indicate this to me, and then we, we could also dig in further. But just to um, give you some 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 idea of, of what's going on. The first one is uh, just a, a very broad picture, starting from the very first really coding standard that was in, in 1984. So it's about approximately uh, 40 years now, um, which uh, with H261, uh, H, H120. And then over the time, uh, the, the specifications you see MPEG-1, MPEG-2, those were the ones that were um, like, like MPEG-2 for, for DVD, for digital um, television uh, broadcast by, by satellite, all these kind of things. You see your MPEG-4, you see ABC, which uh, was a very successful specification. You see HEVC and then VVC, the, the most recent one, which has been uh, finalized in uh, 2021. Right. So then, the, the just just for the just to get an understanding of, of the of these life cycles. Um, so the actually the activity towards the new specification started in 2015. So here in this, that was basically after the end of of uh, the first version of HEVC. Two years later, there was um, a evaluation group looking at potentially um, new uh, new, standard, uh, new new tools for for um, enhanced um, compression efficiency. Uh, there was a, a process that had actually seven iterations to um, for an exploration model, just to study how far one could go. And then there was a CFP in, uh, that was issued um, four years ago, and was evaluated a half a year later, roughly, and. Um, then uh, this basically was the official kickoff for the VVC standardization, which then came to a finalization last year. Okay, and so um, actually things are going on. So this um, this is not stopping. There's uh, a version two of, of VVC emerging and uh, already activities started towards um, um, investigating new, new schemes and um, uh, potentially also now first time considering um, maybe um, neural network based um, approaches. This is something that we um, might see in the not so far future if the complexity works out. Okay, um, BBC in a nutshell, it's very difficult. Actually, I tried to do compression of the compression scheme. So it's, I have uh, 
two slides uh, trying to cover all. Yeah, so we have entropy coding. We, um, BBC is using CAVAC, that's uh, context-based adaptive binary arithmetic coding. That's the, the scheme that already was there in, uh, in ABC. That was the first time when it was introduced, but then has been further developed, of course. Um, there's a um, new variant where multi-hypothesis probability estimation is included to improve the um, uh, decorrelation uh, efficiency. Coding structures are now being up from uh, from four by four. That's very small size. If you consider something like UHD video up to 128 by 128 uh, for the coding units, there's a variety of, of uh, partitioning schemes, including quad tree, ternary tree, or binary trees. Um, that those can be separated uh, for Luma and Chroma. The transforms don't necessarily need to uh, cope with the whole region. They, they can have some some. Um, so some sub blocks um, that are only transformed. Uh, intercoding, this is actually the biggest block. There's a lot of tools. I don't want to go through all those details, but um, um, the, the, the intercoding meaning we have motion compensated prediction um, has, um, has undergone a, a major extension in terms of um, available tools, including things like, like um, optical flow, elements, uh, derivation of motion vectors on the decoder side, and all these kind of things, which not have, have not been there uh, in the previous specifications like AGVC. Well, they, they have been studied, but they have never been adopted. Now they're in. And um, so and, and those, all these, these schemes uh, actually, mo mostly then also work on a, on a sub-block basis. So you would have a larger block, like, I mean, it doesn't need to be 128 by 128, but maybe something like, like 32 by 32 or, or so. Or also some, something rectangular or so, and then you would indicate to use a certain tool, and that would mean that on a four by four block basis you would have some some refinement of the motion based on the properties of the signal, and this gives you a lot of improvement in terms of the uh, visual quality and also of uh, objective qualities, of course, um, when when using this kind of schemes, uh, and this all goes under quite a strict um, compression uh, complexity regime. Intracoding also got quite a number of, of new tools, uh, much more diverse than it was before. AVC, well, um, the, the, the old standards maybe had something like a DC prediction, maybe then horizontal and, and vertical prediction, so that uh, was something like three or four modes. Um, then AVC was extending to nine, um, HAVC was extending to, to 35, and now we are actually, um, if, you, if, if you want to be um, like, like if you want to embrace all, it's, it's 93 different uh, intra prediction modes that you that you would have uh, available for for signaling. And there's a new thing which is called metric space intra prediction. That's actually something that's interesting because it was derived from a neural network based, um, well, relatively shallow but but still a neural network based approach, and then developed into something which was uh, complexity wise acceptable. And now this is basically in. And, and many other many other things um, have been there. The transform stage also has been revised quite a bit. Now you see you can go up to 64 by 64 um, block sizes for um, for transforms, uh, which is an incredible amount of um, of coefficients if you think so. So 30 by, two by 32 is uh, roughly 1,000 coefficients that you would have in the matrix. Um, well, there are some means to reduce the complexity, but still. This is something which is uh, really huge. And um, there, there are multiple transforms. So DST7 and DCT8 are also uh, supported. Um, we, we have mentioned already these sub-block uh, transforms. There's a second stage transform available, the low frequency non-separable transform that comes on top of the block uh, transforms um, and, and, and other things which have been improved quite a bit to enable uh, most uh, well, strongest decorrelation of the, of the signals. Um, for the loop filters, uh, this is a little bit more classical. We have the deblocking filter that has been introduced in ABC. Um, it's already, it's still there, of course, further developed and um, now it's, um, and also further developed compared to the HEVC specification. We have SAO, sample adaptive offset, uh, which was already there in, ABC, in HEVC. And then new is the adaptive loop filter um, and Luma mapping with chroma scaling. Those two things are um, tools which have not been there before and um, enable, uh, well, enhance um, compression efficiency. The, the, this uh, uh, LMCS, so Luma mapping with chroma scaling is actually something that was 
coming from, from the context of HDR, so high dynamic range video coding, but then found also uh, was found to be useful also for uh, for standard dynamic range video. So now it's it's there in all aspects. And there's a lot of lot of more things to do. Um, if you, so last year actually um, Benjamin Bros from HHI and myself were kind of touring through the conferences, giving uh, tutorials of multiple hours on on uh, on BBC. Um, so this one is uh, I, I try to be very brief here. Um, what kind of versatility aspects are there? You have parameter sets, so-called video parameter set, sequence parameter set, picture parameter set. Those. This is a concept that has been established way before already. There's the new adaptation parameter set that's, for example, uh, helpful if you want to um, indicate some 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 parameters. For example, for the adaptive loop filter, and this is a concept that's, that's probably uh, also very useful for future new coding tools. <coughs> <laughs> where you can signal information that may persist for more than one one picture and thereby um, save compression efficiency. Picture types are uh, very similar to HEVC. There's a new thing, which is the so-called gradual decoder refresh, which was as a concept present already in H263, but now finally made it into the formal start, uh, part of the specification. There's a, there are various ways of, of partitioning pictures the classical ones would be slices. Um, the also quite classical ones would be tiles that have been present in HGBC also already. But now we have um, sub pictures. Um, so a big picture can be coded by independent regions. Um, there's um, some 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 more features on the on the slices which can be rectangular um, and, and things like that. So this is providing quite some more flexibility. Specifically, if you think of the immense resolutions that are under consideration right, right now. This is not only UHD, like, like 4K or 8K video, but also um, immersive video, for example, 360, where you would, if you want to, if you really mean it, you probably would like to go beyond 8K for um, compression. But then if you want to show that on a, on a head-mounted display, for example, you only need some 12% of the overall data. So there's a huge amount of data that would need to be provided, but only a little part would be used. And making that locally accessible is something that um, helps a lot in, in bringing such such applications um, towards um, realization. Right? The screen content coding already implemented in like palette mode, interblock copy. Those are things that are pretty have been uh, established before. There's a scheme for reference picture resampling, which means that you can switch the resolution while coding and then make use of the the uh, um, reference pictures of, of different um, resolution. Um, so you, you can have that within the stream. This is something that's actually very, very interesting <coughs> because it uh, may mean that you could adapt the uh, the actually coded resolution to the properties of the content. Right? There's spatial quality and temporal scalability in a way very similar to what has been there before um, um, in, 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 uh, in HEVC, for example. Some, some features for bitstream extractions and there's film grain uh, synthesis, um, which is done in form of a so-called supplemental enhancement information message, SER messages, which means that it's not part of the formal um, um, the, the formal um, decoding process, but has a normative way of, of being realized. And this is actually a tool that has gained um, attention because it may be used also to do some, some kind of tricks for enhanced um, perceived quality. In the development phase, actually, <clears throat> and this is why I'm, I'm providing this slide here as, as, um, as information before we start to, to look at the visual results. Um, well, that was all very much centered on the, on the PSNR. And the PSNR typically has a um, kind of a bad reputation because it's, it would be, it'd be weakly correlated with, um, with subjective measures and other metrics would be much better, which is um, obvious from, from uh, from experiments that have been done, but still, it's a um, it's a usable tool, and this is why I actually wanted to uh, bring that to the attention because it's um, there's a mixed picture on on what people say, what would be feasible or, or suitable for for being done uh, for um, for evaluation. So what you see here is actually the development phase of uh, VVC. Yeah, we have this JEM that was this joint exploration model that I was talking about a couple of slides ago, in, the, in its last version. 
which provided some 30%, 31% of, of uh, YOV beyond the guard delta rate savings in terms of piece and arm. Right? And then came the first version of, uh, of, of uh, VVC in the uh, verification, uh, in the, uh, that's her video coding test model, VTM. And version one was basically stripping out all specific tools and just starting from something which was pretty simple, only having um, the block partitioning and some very little other tools. And this already gave some, some 11%. And then over the versions, you see here, the gains improved and actually went up to some, some 40%. Um, when dropping, this means that there was some, uh, some, some complexity reductions that might have uh, had a an impact on the on the quality, and at the same time we are monitoring here the uh, encoder and decoder runtimes. And you see that the JEM decoder that was is the black solid line here was six times slower than the HEVC test model um, at the time of, of development, which was okay because it was only exploration and was not considered to be um, optimized in that in that way. And the encoder was something like nine percent. Then, well, you see here. Um, in the version one, actually the decoder was faster than than HEVC, while the performance was at uh, some eleven percent of, of improved performance, and the encoder was only two times, roughly two times uh, the duration for for the HEVC one. And then you see that it went up to something like ten percent, and then in the end some some optimizations kicked in so that you ended with some eight percent of of um, <coughs> a factor of eight, sorry, factor of eight. Um, uh, runtime for the encoder, while you only have a uh, factor of 1.6 for the decoder runtime. And this is something, if you consider the development of, of, um, of the encoding standards, having something in the range of factor of two for the decoder side is, uh, has in the past typically been very well digested by, by the um, implementers, uh, both in hardware and, and, and in software. And um, so this is very good news. That the scheme on the on the receiving side typically, I mean, most of the stuff is streaming or broadcasting and things like that, and um, having a lightweight decoder makes a whole lot of sense. Okay, so um, that's that's where we are. Now let, let's look at some some results for the for the verification test, which then demonstrate the performance of the of the scheme. Uh, the first one was um, UHD content, um, so. Um, Basically, roughly 4K, so um, 3,860 by by um, uh, 40 by by um, 2,160 pixels, and um, and then uh, the, the comparison was uh, using the test model of HEVC to the test model of VVC. Both are using pretty much the same type of optimization, so it's uh, it's a good way to compare those. And then there was an additional one, which is the VVENC. Uh, open source VVC implement, uh, encoder implementation that has been done by HHI, and um, that one was diverting from the uh, from this very strict uh, distortion optimization strategies. So it had some some perceptual QP adaptation, and it was uh, also about 100 times faster at the time. Yeah, so it's, I think it's uh, today it's even faster than that um, than the VTM, uh, so the the test model, just to demonstrate. Um, how um, what, what kind of, of um, impacts could be expected here, and then there were um, test sequences. You see here the names, the five, five test sequences. The, these were encoded with random access configuration. So uh, in this configuration, you would have access. To, you you could jump into the video every one second, roughly. Um, the, the group of pictures to, for coding was uh, sixteen for HVC, which was the num maximum number allowed in the specification. VVC allows for more, but where it was used uh, using a, a larger size, and but otherwise, the from from a from a uh, global perspective, those two, um, the, the VTM and the so the, those two test models are quite comparable in terms of, of strategies. And you see quite some nice gains. This is a curve that I have shown before, just to demonstrate these um, rate point alignment uh, things that we have tried to achieve. And then if, if you look at those numbers, then you would compare the or orange curve to the blue curve and the gray one actually to the orange curve, because this tells you that the visual performance of this uh, faster scheme actually is even superior to the performance of the uh, VTM while providing you um, much faster encoding times. Um, the experiments then were, were um, continued for the, um, for the HD content. HD streaming is also quite important um, if you think uh, specifically of streaming to 
two mobile devices. Uh, configuration very similar, so using the same random access configuration that we have used before. But then an additional test was done, um, including also some conversational content and also some content that was somewhat representing gaming applications. It's not. It, 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 this is not a, a test for actually for screen content coding because it was not uh, using like 444, which you typically would have for, for real uh, screen content applications, but rather thinking of something like, like streamed games and, and things like that, which is also a, a huge application space. And um, so the settings um, for, for both of them, again, were, um, were some, somewhat aligned to, to, the, to the largest possible extent. And then the, uh, these measurements were done. So you see here the five, uh, four sequences that were used for um, random access, and then six sequences that were used for low delay. Um, those were actually grouped into uh, two sets. Uh, one would be um, sequences that would represent this uh, the conversational thing. So you would have a person sitting somewhere at, a, at an airport that was Beatrice. You had two sequences where people would be in an office environment and then uh, talking into a a webcam that was basically the, the type, and then we have some 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 gaming type of, of content that was also used for the evaluation, just to cope with all these things. And you see that while we have on on, um, on random access, we have super nice gains here, yeah, around fifty percent. Um, it is it's more challenging on the low delay case, <clears throat> also because quite some of the tools that have been developed for in BBC somewhat rely on the fact that you would have the um, the hierarchical structures in the um, in the coding schemes. Which then provide you um, benefits that were not fully exploitable in this um, in this challenge and content, but, but still the, the gains I think are pretty impressive here. Um, now then uh, comes the next one that was HDR content. As you know, the HDR is uh, actually the new uh, let's say standard uh, dynamic range. So so. Um, Meaning that it's, it's something that we expect to be to come to regular use um, very very soon, and um, there's a lot of aspects that will come into consideration when you talk about HDR content, um, including um, well the, the type of HDR we have uh, hybrid log gamma as the as the one version of it, and then we have this uh, subject quantization scheme PQ, um, which which are two different um, ways of representing it. And PQ has the feature that it would also indicate the um, basically the peak luminance, so the, the maximum display mastering uh, mastering luminance. This is the value that we have here, and um, so th there there are more parameters to consider, and there are types of content to to be considered, and that's where we, where we came up with uh, with uh, two sets. One was um, oh I forgot to put the type. So this is actually this is HLG, and this is um, this is the PQ type. And um, then for the for PQ, we actually have two different uh, um, uh, uh, maximum peak luminance values. One was um, 1,000 nits and one was 4,000 nits. And the whole content then was uh, displayed on a uh, on a consumer display, so so that the uh, um, that would mimic what what actually actually um, regular users would experience. Yeah. So we we use some. Um, state-of-the-art um, consumer displays of 65 inch typically, and then those were fed with those uh, HDR content, and then we did the visual assessment uh, just, just to do it in this, in this way. And the, the signaling, everything was done so that the displays would, would know what kind of content it is and uh, what, what kind of settings we have here also for the peak luminance for PQ. And then um, those evaluations um, were conducted. And you see that we got quite some, some very nice uh, gains here again in the ballpark of some 50% of rate savings for the, um, for the new specification here. Okay, and then um, the, the last class that I want to present is for space is some, some, uh, showing the one, all the, the content that we have um, evaluated so far. Um, this is a 360 video content. Um, you see here the resolution of the content um, of the original content, and you see quite some some impressive numbers here. And then uh, for the coding, actually those were converted to some projection formats. And actually there were two that were considered. But the first one is the equirectangular projection um, in the in a version that is padded, meaning that at the outskirts you would have some some area that would overlap, and then this would not be regarded when reconstructing the scene, just to avoid some some artifacts. 
and you see, you see the equilibrium rectangular projection is something like like a world map unrolls to a rectangular region. And this is how we would um, code that. Um, and the other one was the so-called pub map projection, which again was was used in two variants. Again with some some padding, and then the generalized version is a bit more flexible even. And the, the rough scheme of that is that you would have, if you look around, I mean we are 360, so we can we have a video content in, in all in all directions. And then this is projected projected to a, a cube. And this is then unfolded. You see here, it's like like this would be front view in the middle, and then we would have the left and right sides, and then we would have here we would have the back, and then we would have some bottom, and here we would have the the top area. And this is then put into one one video for um, for coding for the coding purpose. Yeah, so th those two schemes were considered again with random access because this is uh, content that was supposed to be. Probably something like like streaming type of of, um, of applications, and um, so this is why the random access settings are the same as in the in the previous um, uh, categories. Now here we have a, actually a specific uh, situation because 360 allows you to move around. Right? So the idea is that the that the user the user does not see this kind of, of material. It never is shown to to the the person, but you would only look into a certain direction, and then you get the portion of the video that's in your uh, field of view right and this is uh, something um, um, this is uh, something that has to be regarded because we don't know anymore where people would look when ac accessing this and for the purpose of the verification tests um, we decided to go with a relatively classical approach where we would have a predefined uh, view path and then uh, so the, the the view path itself was relatively slow uh, a regular user might just look around quickly and, and look from left to the right and so so on, so that you would have um, <coughs> that, that they can explore this, the scene. But if you are exposed to such a video and you are not controlling the, these directions, you actually get uh, server sick very quickly. So for, for the purpose of these tests, a relatively slow view path was defined, and then um, this was rendered to a sixteen by nine. Uh, video at HD resolution, and then this video was assessed with the conventional uh, method. And you see here the results, which are actually even higher, so up to 56% on average um, over the test set, which tells us that these tools, there, there are specific tools for these uh, for these purposes in VVC, and which have not been there in, in HVC. And so these things pay off because of the, um, um, well, as we can see from the improved uh, compression efficiency that we have here. Okay, and that's covering the the presentation for the um, for the verification test. And I, I see that there's a question from Olena um, on slide 27, so I can go back. And this is uh, so the numbers that we have here. Um, th these are um, these are MOS values, right? So it's um, this is, this is um, the, the mean opinion score of the of this users. So it's all the components. So the question was, if the gains uh, would be uh, weighted by your V results, and since they are not PSNR, they are they are the um, um, well the, the, the MIS value based on the on the opinions by the by the participants. Okay, the, the ones on the previous slide here, these ones. This is the YOV PSNR. And then compute it here as a joint value for the for the subjective metric. So based on the on the mean square error, basically. Okay. And let's go um, back again to the, to the next step, which is challenges from the quality assessment for immersive visual media. Um, I, I just have so this is not the the high art of of. Uh, of immersive video coding, but just to highlight this aspect that I was discussing on uh, a bit before, this would be is one test uh, sequence um, that uh, has been provided for the for the standardization purposes um, quite a little bit of time ago. But it kind of demonstrates, I think, what could happen. So um, actually, when I was um, exposed to that sequence, so the, as, a, as a user, you're allowed to to look around where you like to, right? and then. Uh, when I first saw that sequence, I was not looking in the direction where we are looking at right now, so like uh, seeing the beer, but I was actually just facing the opposite direction. And I only saw these people and they saw, okay, they're behaving strange. And then at some point I turned around and then I had the beer, the beer right in front of me, which was a, a 
quite a surprise. And um, these kind of things have a lot of impact on, on how you watch these sequences because um, you might need to watch watch around to look around in order to to get um, get um, the, the content that is presented. Um, and you might do that at very high speed. You have a very different way of accessing the video compared to conventional um, video, um, 2D video, where you would just have the screen and you just stick to that. And this is only 360, which means we are in a so-called three degrees of freedom scenario. So the camera would be at one point and then we are free to look around in, in any region. Um, but this would be extended with the, with the specifications that we are currently um, having being developed in, in MPEG. We go from this three degrees of freedom where somebody would just be able to move the head to three degrees of freedom plus where you would have some limited space in, in which you could move towards what people would call the window uh, six degrees of freedom here where you would have some more uh, freedom of actually going back and going forth and, and exploring the scene and then going to omnidirectional or completely free six degrees of freedom where you could just walk around the scene and doing these things. And all these kind of uh, modalities are actually tackled in, in specifications that are currently under development. So you have uh, like the 360, you have video-based point clouds, you have um, geometry-based point clouds, <coughs> you have MPEG immersive uh, uh, video, which is projecting depth information and, and, uh, and video to construct a 3D scene dynamic meshes, light fields are coming up. So there's a lot of, of different variants. And uh, there are actually quite some significant challenges that come from there. Um, because, uh, well, the, just in, in terms of design, if you have this, uh, this high amount of content, uh, you need to have a different uh, per, uh, perception of, of uh, or a different method of, of, of accessing the, the content in the appropriate way. Uh, so you need this random access plays a role, a role, but also the local access and being able to track the um, movement that the that the user would make, but also things like transmission rates and and uh, and also so the bandwidth and the and the latency because if if people move, they need to have the uh, the video moving consistently with your uh, with the with the head, otherwise they will. Um, they will not be uh, well. There, there will be a disconnect between what they do and what they see, and this uh, induces a lot of uh, service sickness and things like that. So, um, if we consider that, right? These, these are just some examples of, of content. So, we would have here some uh, some videos um, that are used in, in this uh, MIF, so um, MPEG immersive video content uh, context, where you would be able to move around uh, in a in a limited way in a in a, uh, in a complete um, three-dimensional uh, scene. Here we would have some 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 point clouds. Here we would have some some meshes, which represent more. Uh, so the the, the myth uh, approach is more like showing a, a complete scene, and then you would be able to position yourself relative to that scene, um, but but being immersed in the in the scene that is presented. While the other ones, uh, for example, um, the, the video-based point cloud coding or what's coming up with the meshes, is uh, more concerning with uh, with, with objects. That you would like to place somewhere, yeah, so they are like you would would watch the video or the the, the data, the content item, uh, for example, by by placing it on a table, and then you could watch it through your mobile mobile device and um, just see it in the context of the uh, of the real scene. So you have some some kind of augmentation that would be done there. So this is, it's different types of of applications that are behind, and the way we want to measure the the quality of those then also needs to be different, right? Um, so for the well, the, for the user impression that we get, and actually, which we would measure with um, uh, with some some subjective uh, testing, uh, this highly depends on what what the what the user selects as um, as the as the portion in, of, of the scene. And uh, actually, here you you see these names. We have the viewport, the view path, the camera path, the post trace. Those are all terms for almost the same thing. It's the describing how you move through the scene and where you look and all these kind of things um, in order to render what you what you would perceive, for example, on the head mount display or also on the, uh, um, well, uh, on the rendered screen if you do so. And the objective assessment actually has a different approach because um, now if we want to measure the quality, then we could do that, um, for example, 
at the points where we would actually have camera capture content, if we are looking at such, such content, <clears throat> we might be able to compare to some synthesized uh, material that was not compressed, but being at the best quality that you would have, and then you could have some distance measure uh, and all these uh, these kind of things. And this is um, there. There are typically that we have some some kind of distance metrics which are currently used, and then trying to measure the distance be between the what we then would call the original and the coded version. And um, now, since we are starting to do formal testing also on this material, we are looking into the the um, the quality or the, the, the reliability of these metrics um, compared to the visual assessment of the schemes. And this brings me actually to the last part. I think I need to speed up a little bit, um, which is on the remote experts viewing, um, which we have actually uh, set up uh, because of the pandemic situation. I mean, the reason why I'm not in Brazil right now, but um, sitting at home and then talking to you is that we have still this pandem pandemic situation and tra traveling is really difficult. And this also means that we cannot have uh, assessments during the meetings, which we typically did in the past, where we would have the display brought and some, some uh, uh, computers capable of, of displaying the material, and then we would do some, some uh, measurements. And so this is actually always needed when you, when you want to make a decision where the objective metrics that are used, like the PSNR, for example, uh, are considered not to be sufficiently reliable. So you need some kind of, um, if you, but you want still to come to a decision. So typically what we would have would be something like an AB comparison. So we would have the anchor, we have a proposal that changes something there. And then we do the assessment and we want to know is the, the one thing better or the other one. And this um, method has been developed and um, also written down in, this, in a guideline document and it has been successfully applied in, in, in JVEG, in, uh, in the MIF group uh, for VPCC, and also just um, last week in the, uh, or the week before last week, in the preparation of the dynamic mesh um, call for proposals, which is just emerging right now. And um, how would that look like? Very quickly, so we would have a, a, a proposal which is uh, was considered worthwhile of investigating it, and there would be a coordination person the content would be selected, so sequences, rate points, configurations. Um, the sequences actually would be provided then as MP4 files because we have to do it remotely, and um, we cannot expect everybody to have a, um, a a player playing out a raw video uncompressed to a um, studio monitor. This is not possible, <coughs> but um, this is why we we come up with um, with MP4 files. The um, the duration of the sequences should be very, very similar across the set uh, in total. So the, we, we have done successful tests with five second sequences. Um, the typical ones would be 10 seconds. Actually, the five seconds are maybe even more efficient in the context of expose viewing. <clears throat> then um, for, for immersive content, um, the, the viewports or the, the post traces that should be considered um, need to be agreed. There needs to be some cross checking so that the files that are provided for the test are actually the right ones. There need to be uh, sufficient numbers of, of uh, volunteers. <coughs> um, we actually contribute to that, um, and um, well, they, they need to be. Uh, they have to have, to have um, sufficient um, visual acuity. They should be have, have normal color vision. They need to have the appropriate display and a, a computer that's capable of playing it out. They need to have a somewhat appropriate environment. This is actually some, all this stuff is something that we can't control, right? This is making the remote experts view more challenging than a real one because we are not interacting with people, but rather um, just remotely via, maybe via Zoom, like like what we're doing here and still somehow need to, to get to the results. We want to have something like 15 that is scored typically. Um, um, if, if there's only the need for some, some indications then maybe something like eight, would be just okay, but then people should be very careful with their decisions. And then, so as I mentioned, we, we are going on MP4 files. We use the VLC player because that's something that's available for everybody um, with some, uh, well, VLC provides us some, some, some commonality between all the participants. And also we are able to just provide one playlist that just then perform, um, performs on, on uh, Windows, on Mac, on Linux machines, whatever. And that makes it very helpful. We have some some very simple command lines uh, how we would compress the, the content you see at a quite a high quality um, using HEVC, and then uh, this would be used. 
and so the player, of course, has to be set up in a certain way so that um, it's not disturbing um, the, the participants. And then for the test design itself, we, I mentioned we would do AV comparisons. It could be using an original sequence a, a source or not. Both versions are, have been used. And you would have something like you, you see the video A, you see the video B, you see A again, you see B again, and then you would have five seconds of voting time. And the um, those would, would be the one would be the proposal and one would be the, the anchor. And uh, we, of course, don't tell you if A is the anchor or the proposals. This is something that would be randomized so that the participants um, can't, um, can't cheat by, by knowing which, which would be which. And there's some um, aspects that are typically done in the, in the design of the test sessions. Like they shouldn't be too long. So because people get tired at some point, there would be some kind of stabilization. And then there would be some checks of the test subjects just to see if, if things work out and if we have some technical issues, for example. So that would be, uh, for example, A-B comparisons, including the original sequences, or a self-comparison where A and B would be the same. And then if somebody would say they are clearly different, then we would uh, wonder what happens. Right? So this is just down here in the illustration where would you see. So those three were stabilizations, so they come up later here. And then you have one which was an original sequence uh, that has been used for this, for this example test. And then uh, how to scale those things. We have currently two variants. The one would be a seven grade scale being at zero for equivalence and then going up to plus three. If it's very clearly, if the first sequence is much clearly better than the, the second one or going to the other direction. Um, so here you are able to, to indicate that you find both equivalent. We, uh, in JVIT specifically, we have the, um, have been using quite a bit the four grade scale where we actually do not allow people to say uh, sequence look alike, they have to decide. And so then this uh, equivalence actually uh, averaged out by the number of participants. And this is actually something that works quite well also. Statistically, we, we find that um, if people can't vote, so some are voting plus one, some are voting minus one, and in total we just get zero out. So that's um, something that's there. Both have their pros and cons, so we, we have used both um, successfully. And so actually we, uh, we, we use the, the uh, P910 DCR method um, first time also in this uh, remote context and found that this actually also worked um, pretty well uh, for, for getting some um, for dry run results um, in the mesh context. So that was uh, pretty helpful. And then for the, finally for the uh, data collection, people are actually handed uh, PDFs. So they are supposed to print them. They look somewhat like, like what I'm showing here. So that they, during the session, they just have to make check marks. In the voting time, they just make a, a cross in the box uh, so that they're distracted um, at, least, uh, as, at least as possible. They get the data up front, but it's protected so that they can't uh, sneak preview. They, they just get the stuff once and then they're supposed to score. And then in the, in the meeting, there's an introduction. They get the access to the data itself. And then they just, all the participants do the test at the same time. That's uh, basically how it's meant to be. And then they, they score on the paper so that they are not distracted. Um, there may be multiple uh, sessions uh, of, of testing within one online meeting, um, which is conducted. And then the data after that would be scored. So we have set up a website that we're using where, where the participants have a personal login and then they just enter their scores. And then, then the, the data is ready for evaluation. And um, so, um, and then in the end, well, for, for evaluation, we do de-randomization um, so that we have, uh, uh, that we know again, uh, the anchor and the, and the proposal, we compute a MOS out of the score that we have either the seven grade or the four grade one, we compute a confidence interval. <coughs> we we look, at, look at the uh, checks that we did uh, at outliers uh, at the correlation of, of the scorings, and then we produce a report with some plots. And this is just an example that has been produced and where you see, well, so you have some, some test points and you see this was using the four grade scale. And you see for some cases like this one, this is a clear indication that, um, for example, the proposal was rated better than the anchor here in this case as well. Here you have a case where it was not rated better, it was rated slightly worse. And you have cases where it's not so clear or maybe even um, clear that it's somewhat is, is the same value if you have overlapping confidence intervals. And from there, you can make your conclusions. Okay, and that's it. I'm, I'm a little bit over time, but I hope it's it's still okay. So we had this overview on the on the um, advisory group. 
I talked a bit on verification testing on the remote experts being inspired by this problem of having quality assessment for immersive visual media, where we sometimes are actually not able to um, have a objective metrics that really would work out. And uh, for that, thank you very much. I see there's one question, so uh, I would now um, just take a second to read that and then uh, try to answer. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, I think I'll, I'll read the question out loud so that everyone... Okay, can yes, thank you. Okay, it's a, um, a question from Professor Matthias Grelert. Uh, he thanks uh, you for the interesting talk. And he, he has two questions. In the first one, he says that much of the research is, uh, done in video coding involves, involves testing proposals with uh, natural scenes only, but screen content is getting a lot of more importance nowadays. So do you think that specific metrics for screen content coding should be investigated or the ones used so far are already capable of assessing the quality for this type of content? Okay, so that's a, it's a very good question. Um, and I, I mean, I think you're right uh, with, the, with this uh, assessment that the, the computer generated content is, uh, is gaining attention. I mean, we just have to, to look at Twitch, uh, which is full of, of uh, computer generated co content and things like that. And um, I think the, the conventional metrics may not be optimum at this point, which is something that we have seen from uh, when preparing the screen content sequences um, uh, or the, the gaming type of sequences uh, in the verification test, for example. And um, so this is um, probably due to the fact that the original content has um, very different um, high frequency characteristics than the uh, camera capture content. So it's, it's much more high frequent typically and has much sharper edges than the um, camera capture content has. And this is something that's not, uh, well, that, that doesn't uh, play in very nicely, um, for example, with the PSNR. Um, so you might have a huge PSNR difference, but you don't see anything, <laughs> for example, um, and, and these kind of aspects. And um, this is, um, so this is something that probably can, uh, should be investigated or should at least be regarded. When, when looking at uh, objective measurements. And for the, for the second question, I just see uh, this about recent metrics. Um, uh, thank you very much for bringing that up because uh, I, I didn't pronounce it very well, but um, this ad hoc group um, where, where we are looking at the learning best metrics actually is, look, is intending to look at all, all metrics that are available, also including like uh, LPI, PS and so forth. And also the, um, like, I mean, VMAF and so on, they are, um, or experiment piece now or whatever they, they don't need to, not all of them need to be learned but we want to know how well do they work in our context and um, specifically just going back to that slide here um, these kind of situations right so we have uh, we have a proposal and we have the uh, the anchor and we want to know is the proposal back, better than than the anchor and here we did a visual test now I would like to know how well do the metrics for example the one that you've just mentioned or, or just the PSNR, how well do they represent this kind of decision? Yeah, so is this decision reflected in the metric as well? And, and how reliable is that? And um, we want to learn that. So this, it's not about saying, I want to compare ATVC against VVC or, I, um, or something which would be relatively far apart. And um, we know that, that there is like, like VMAF they, they, or, or MSSM or something like that, they produce very nice uh, results uh, um, and, and showing that they are actually closer to the subjective evaluation than, than the piece in R. But uh, is that also true in the context of, of uh, tool-based uh, decisions? And this is something that we want to investigate and learn. Um, but also, of course, um, so having better metrics is always good. And if we, um, although it's, it's good to have visual testing, and I think actually for people developing algorithms, I'm always saying that it's, uh, they shall look at the videos, right? It's not only piece and R curves. It's um, um, you should see how the video looks like because it's uh, in, unless you're doing uh, video coding for machines, uh, it's uh, you're doing video coding for humans. So you should use the human visual system to somehow assess what's going on. And uh, well, having a metric that that provides you reliable information if we go to the right direction, this is super helpful. But knowing how it looks, I think is also something that should be should be regarded. Okay. I don't think we have another question here. I have one. So in, in slide 25, you you show a comparison between VVM, VVM, and VVM. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, my, my question was, uh, how do you explain uh, VVN providing higher coding efficiency than VTM in some scenarios? Because if, if the tools are simplified in VVM or sped up uh, during uh, using some strategies to reduce complexity or using early determinations, uh, I would expect a, a, lower, a lower coding efficiency, always. Yeah. So you, you were talking about this slide, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah the, the so, code inefficiency of Vivian sometimes is, is higher than, I know it's MOS, MOS. I mean, some, uh, that may be the, the, the explanation, but uh, we would exp expect always the, the uh, worse uh, code inefficiency for Vivian, right? I, I think if you, if you look at the documents, I, I don't have the numbers here, but uh, if you look at the documents, and you just look at the piece in R, or you look at the SSA, MS, um, SSIM or so, it may look uh, horrible. Mm -hmm. right? So the performance may look quite bad, but it's not optimized for that uh, for those metrics. It's optimized um, on this uh, perceptual approach where, where it would weight in basically the, the um, well, some, some perceptual aspects like, like structure and so forth in the decisions on how to tune the quantizer. And, um, so if, if you look at the conventional metrics, I think it doesn't perform uh, impressive, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, the, the piece in R performance is not the one that you would aim for if you, if you think about protection encoding, because then you would like to have a good quality that is visual, right? And so, so that's, I mean, it's, the, the curve is some, somewhat interesting because it's, uh, it seems to be working well on the, like the, um, the uh, point 0.2 and point 0.4, um, but this also maybe, I mean, it's, it's something that was in development. You see the, the version that was used here was uh, 0 0.1, so a very early version. And I mm -hmm. think they, they worked on the um, uh, on, on the encoder performance uh, quite a bit. Okay. And, um, yeah, so I mean, summarizing, I, I would say if you look at objective metrics, like specifically the PSNR, uh, it would not tell you the, the story that you see from these curves. Right? Okay. okay, we have another question from Andre Drescher. How are the test sequences sourced during the development process of the guidelines? Are such sources available for free access? Um, also a very good question. It's a, and it's a, at the same time, it's a difficult one because it's, uh, so some of the sequences uh, are actually um, quite freely available. Yeah, so if you just look at the slide, um, we see the, uh, oops, okay. Yeah, so uh, like like driving POV is a sequence that is uh, from a Netflix database that has been uh, released uh, some maybe four years ago or five years ago or something like that. And this one you you, you should find uh, on actually uh, probably on a Netflix website and it's freely available so you can use it. Um, and then, then we have here we have some I think Marathon, Mountain Bay and Tall Buildings. I think they are from a Chinese university or so. I think they are also free. Um, the Neptune Fountain is a uh, one from, from HHI. I think they, they wanted to release it. I don't know if it has, has happened yet, but some of them see, of those sequences are actually freely available. Um, some licensors actually only provide the sequences, unfortunately, for, uh, for example, for standardization purposes. And in these cases, um, it's, they are only available if you're uh, actively contributing to the uh, standardization effort. Um, in other cases, they may even be only licensed uh, for a specific, very specific purpose. And then uh, we are even not allowed to, to share that sequence uh, within the standardization group. And this, this is things that, that happened in the past. And so, I mean, you have seen that one of the, um, uh, of, of the mandates that the, that the advisor group is, is acquiring data. So I'm, I'm talking to uh, people providing content I, and I, I try to motivate them to provide uh, content also freely so that um, I mean, universities who are not uh, working standardization, that they also are able to make use of such content and make, um, um, make their developments and their research based on the, this kind of, of things, right? But um, typically it's, it's not super easy to get this kind of content um, very open. Yes. Okay. Do we have another question here? Not, not in the chat. Oh, I think it's already 3 p.m. here. I think we have to, to close now because the next talk will start shortly. 
So okay. uh, I would like to, to thank you, Matthias, uh, uh, once again. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to speak at the DPVSA. Uh, and let's hope that one day you can visit us here in Brazil. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and give, us, give us a talk in person. Yeah, I, I would really like to. OK. <laughs> OK, then. So uh, let, let me just see. No, no question. Uh, I was checking there was another one. OK, thank you uh, once again. Uh, and see you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.